Wow, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Okay, so today's topic is money. And many of us, uh, maybe all of us, use money in some form or another. And it is a, a, a uh, let's say ubiquitous, or meaning that it's all over uh, most of the things we do. And uh, it, it, it occupies a almost larger than life uh, space in our lives to the point that almost everything we attempt to do or think or something, one of the questions that comes up is, well, who's going to pay for it? How much does it cost? You know? Um, so I thought that's very interesting in light of when I've asked people before very fundamental questions about money, particularly like the history of it and that kind of thing, um, they don't seem to have thought about it very deeply. It's just this abstract thing that you get and you give people this thing that they call money and then you get something else. And then you take that something else and maybe you get some money from giving that person or exchanging that thing uh, for some money. But, but to that, ex to that uh, question, I think it's important to, to start this conversation with uh, your ideas about how would you define money? And not just a dollar bill, but how would you define money? Make sure you put your mics on when you're going to talk. Yeah. Well, I think it's very interesting because money is like everywhere. It's involved in all these different things that we do. Uh, it influences us so much, you know, whether it's government programs or our personal lives or, or planning for our futures or all kinds of things, money is there. So it seems like we would have, even if it's not all inclusive or academic, we would have some idea of, well, what is this thing, money? How would we express that? I would, uh, hmm, money, modern money is paper and coins and whatnot, but in the olden days, even last week, um, <laughs> money is an exchange of items to, like you were saying, to beget other items. Because in the old days, the bartering system or the system of wealth and so on had to do a, a lot with sugar, not sugar, salt and pepper and spices and so on. But um, I just wanted to put that in there because I will be leaving shortly. Um, but there's a thing that I had, I was telling you the other day, Ayana Van Zandt, money is M-O-N-E-Y, my own natural energy yield and money has uh, is an energy. So that's all I'm saying for now. I will have to leave at some point, but I'll catch it on the flip flop. Okay. Okay. Lee? Uh, it's very, <laughs> it, there are so many avenues to it. And I was thinking of words for it and I'm at a loss for words. I come up with the word power. And then I was thinking about security, security, how? Um, is security things, uh, human made, human produced, whatever? Mm. Or is it really dealing with our feelings, our true under feelings? Do we really get security from just money? 
I don't think so. It's ambiguous. Uh, it's really a very thoughtful question, Lawrence. But I have a feeling there's a difference between wants and needs. I don't need things, so I don't depend on things for my happiness. But I need people around me and the feelings that develops between human beings that I think gives me security and hope and happiness, not things. So I, it's a difficult word to describe. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else have an idea of like how they would define money? If we have enough money, we, it doesn't occupy our minds. If we don't have enough money, if we're living in poverty, it's on our minds constantly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, that that I, I can see that very clearly, Carolyn. I'm asking, however, I'm asking the definition. I, no flies on anything you said, not just taking anything away. <laughs> But mm -hmm. I am asking for a definition as opposed to an effect or something like that. And I can't come up with the definition. That's why I gave you this information. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, okay. So I, I think it, it, it's safe to say that there is something called money that is that plays an important role in our lives. But most of us have not stopped to define well what is money you know so uh i'm going to say for this discussion i'm going to say that money is a medium of exchange for value okay a medium of exchange for value and that means a medium is something that mediates or goes between so it's like something that allows us to take the value of one thing and place it on another thing, right? So in other words, I have a value on a cow and I want some eggs. If I, if I try to balance out the value of a cow with eggs gets pretty tricky, right? Because you got this big cow and you got this, let's say even a dozen eggs. Well, how many dozen eggs is a cow worth? That becomes tricky. But if I can put a money value, a standard, a medium on the cow, now I can split up that thing into the value for an egg. And I don't, you don't have to sell me the whole cow or let me cut off the cow's ear. And then I take it in and I give you some eggs. You know, I can take the value of the cow and say, okay, that let's say for discussion, this is not a real price. Let's say for discussion, that's a thousand dollar cow. So if I get a thousand dollars and I want a dozen eggs, let's say I give you two dollars, right? So I've I can give you the two thousand, I can give you the two dollars because I've I with money I'm able to separate into smaller and or larger parts that the, the the money and transferred that much of the value to some eggs okay and that comes from just a little backstory the idea of paper money comes from an idea when people thought that gold was a medium of exchange but the problem for gold was not so different than problem changing the value for cow for eggs it's like okay you well, you got this thing of gold and I have to measure it out every time. And at least with the gold, I can click off a piece and the gold doesn't die. If you did that a few times to a cow, you say, well, this, this is worth one leg of the cow, you know? Well, it's, it's kind of hard just to cut off that one leg, especially when the next guy wants the same thing and you cut off the two legs. Well, that kind of, you know, that could become complicated. So what people did is also gold was hard to keep. You know, because if you had a stockpile of gold, you were, a, 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 you know, a magnet to people who wanted to take that gold from you. 
So people will put it in these vaults where they can all sort of like collectively protect it. And then uh, if they wanted, you know, since different people had their gold in their different things, you know, different little sections of the, the gold vault, it wasn't really a bank at that point. Um, then I would come and I would say, hey, look, I, I want this land that Joe got and Joe's agreed to sell it to me. And Joe would write me a note saying, hey, you know that gold I have in your thing uh, on, in, in, in my little slot? Uh, give 500 ounces to Frank because I'm going to like buy some land. So the, the guy at the bank at the gold place would take some grams of of Joe's gold and put it over on Frank's side, okay? And he would have this note from uh, Joe saying that that was what he wanted him to do and that's how you kept your accounting, okay? Well, at some point people realized, well, nobody really knows how much gold is in here. So we can, we can just sort of like, just move the gold around. You know, nobody knows the amount, the total amount. So, uh, out of that came money. In other words, now this goal, this place would say, we want to offer you, we will get, when you give us, um, when you give us your gold, we will give you these notes saying that you have this much gold in, you know, that you can exchange. So if I give you a stack of those, then I can take it and we can change, we can make purchases in that way. This is a really quick 50,000 foot view of history, but it helps you to understand, I hope helps you to understand that it's a medium of exchange. It, it, it doesn't, the money was never, it doesn't have value in it of itself. It just says there's this gold. And if you want to, if you want this much gold, just move for this thing, I will move my gold over to your side. Now you have more gold because there's this note over here says that's how many ounces of gold you have. Okay, so fast forward, somebody realizes, okay, look, we could, if you could do that with gold, you could do it with silver, you could do it with copper, you could do it with anything, just this, this piece of paper represents, I'm transferring the value that I have in that thing to you, okay? So uh, all of this is important because sometimes people say, oh, we should go back to the gold standard. The gold standard didn't work then, it's even less likely to work now for the same reasons that it didn't work then, right? because economies got too big and markets got too big, there wasn't enough gold to satisfy all of those markets. So people started thinking of silver. Well, it wasn't enough silver either. And all the other things. Now you say, well, this guy's got gold and this guy's got silver, this guy's got wood. Some of the things deteriorate, others don't deteriorate. What's the, what's the standard here? I mean, how much gold is worth, how much silver? You know, if this guy says, well, you know, uh, I got this much silver and this much gold. What's the balance between those two? That's where you get to a more or less a universal, at least national currency, you know, because the, and that's why a lot of currencies, most currencies aren't backed by anything because there isn't enough of any one thing to do that. Okay. And so when people talk about that, it's usually, you know, serious economists don't talk about gold standards or anything like that anymore, you know. But all of that is the important because it points out to that fundamentally the gold doesn't represent anything. I mean, the money doesn't represent anything but our imaginations, right? We Somebody says, well, here's a dollar. In our imagination, a dollar's worth one thing to me and another thing to you. For example, if I make $5 an hour and you make $50 an hour, that one dollar is worth less to you than it is to me because i i had to work 20 minutes for for uh, to get that dollar you know or oh, is it 20 minutes no it's not even that <laughs> 10 minutes but i i have i have to work a lot longer than you have to work to get a dollar right so if we say that time is kind of the universal thing if we don't have time we don't have anything then the, my time and whatever I had and my effort to make a dollar makes that dollar more precious to me than to you, right? Because I had to put in more effort and more time to get that dollar. So even then, it's not a standard thing. 
So that's kind of like a, maybe even too brief of a background, but as much as I think is maybe even too much to absorb in one, one setting. But fundamentally, uh, my point here is the value of money is imaginary. It, it, in other words, and it's imaginary in the sense that, and it's also something we agree on from transaction to transaction, we, we agree on it. So it's all floating around. This store sells five apples for a dollar. This one sells four apples for a dollar. The same dollar, same apples over here. You get more, there's more value for that dollar than it is over here. So clearly the value of the dollar of the money fluctuates right? from country to country, store to store, person to person. Okay. So then that brings us to the point of, oh, is, did I, uh, say something there that anybody either takes issue with or has another perspective, now that I've thrown that out there. If, do you have another perspective? Because I never think that I have the only idea, just an idea, we gotta get started. Anybody else? Okay, all right. So then the next question is, what does money mean to you? What significance does it have to you in your daily life? I'm assuming it does have meaning. You're making my brain hurt. <laughs> okay, well, let's let's kind of break let's let's break break this question down a little bit easier. What do you use money for? To provide food transportation, uh, shelter, the basics of life. Okay. Buy things and service. Am I, am I on the same page with you, Carol? Say that again. To, to buy goods and services? Yes. Okay, good, okay. Anyone else? And they step um, our digest of goods and services throughout your life, but that all really changes what it what money meant to us. <coughs> Excuse me, when we were younger, um, what we used it for is so much different than what we use it for as we get older. Our priorities change. Um, getting a Coke and sitting driving around with their friends or something it was the highlight then. Now it's maybe more medical stuff as you get older and housing and stuff. Yeah, I, when I was a kid, I never thought about that kind of stuff. So your priorities change. Money stays the same, and that's important, but you use it so differently at different stages in your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I think we, we experienced that then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? What do you use money for? Well, I think we can we can say clearly that you know money is used for different things. Um, we may come back to that because I think it's it's kind of central. Like, not only what do you use money for, but let's go now to what kind of things 
can money not buy? Okay, what kind of things we, we like to think of goods and services, tangibles, measurables, things that we can measure, things that we can touch and see. We like to think that we can buy that with money. Um, but there might be things that just, no matter how much money we have, we can't buy those things. Maybe we can buy simulations of them, but we can't buy them. Well, it can't buy happiness. Mm -hmm. I don't think. Of course, it yeah. depends who, what makes people happy. So I can't say that. Yeah, but the money but, doesn't make them happy. The thing that they buy with the money makes them happy. Right. I was thinking that well, basic needs, that shelter, food, and that, that's our basic needs. Mm -hmm. and, and if people don't have that and there are people in our society that are lacking money to provide those needs. And personally, it makes me happy to spend my money to help those basic needs for the population if I can. Um, that's a very deep question, Lawrence, but that's how I feel about it. Yes, sure, sure. Well, thank you for your input. Um, anyone else, what kind of things can money not buy? It cannot buy your way into heaven. <laughs> He's God is God is one of the few people that isn't impressed by how much money you have. Sometimes on earth you can buy prestige. It's not the same as prestige you earn by doing good things. But you can kind of impress some people with that. God is not impressed by that. He's more impressed by what you do with your money, even if you only have a few pennies. He's more impressed with what you do with that. I'm sure there's other things too, mm. but that just came to mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Deb. Anyone else, things that money cannot buy it cannot buy a safe environment if you're in an area of extreme um violence mm -hmm. true mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyone else thank you carolyn something else that money can't buy. It can't buy your crew friends. It can buy your friends, maybe, and people to be around you. But true friends that will be with you thick and thin can't be bought by money, I don't think. Yeah, very interesting. I, I, it, when you say that, Deb, it brings to mind that um, I, I don't know if there's this tradition in other places, but in in some areas, in some cult, China has many cultures, but in some of the cultures, there, it, it particularly, it seems like in Hong Kong and the Southern Chinese, there is this custom that when a person dies, they actually pay people to mourn. You know, it's and for some people, that's a professional job. They're mourners, you know? And uh, so it's not enough to pay somebody to come and have a eulogy. Like we, we do that often here. We pay a minister to come and say good things about the deceased, mm -hmm. even though the minister often had no idea, never met the deceased, but somebody, he may be interviewed and somebody may give him a script or whatever. 
but we essentially pay that minister to sort of say, hey, this guy was a decent guy, or at least he's not going to get, he's decent now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe not before, but he is now. So we, we have a tradition of paying the one person for that. But in some cultures, they have a tradition of paying, uh, you know, professional mourners to come and weep and say, oh, Fawn was so wonderful, you know. <laughs> That just seems so foreign. Yeah, it is foreign. <laughs> well, but the thing I is, thought of one more thing. thing. Mm, I thought okay. of one more thing. Sure. Money cannot buy an appreciation of nature. Mm. Okay. Okay. And it really can't buy health, good health. It can pay for through medical operations that you need done, but it can only go so far. There, there's a limit to that stuff, it seems like. And that's like, I'm sorry, we did everything we could do in this case. It's not like, okay, if you pay more, you you would your defense would get for them. It's like, no, I'm sorry, we run the gamut here. There's nothing more you we can do or and we can't throw money at that that won't make it better. Mm. So it can help maybe and I'm sure there's people that would like better medical care that money could buy. But there's like a limit to it and ceiling or something. Mm. Then no matter how much money you have, that's it gonna change things. Okay, so uh, anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you, Dan. Anyone else? Something money cannot buy. I was going to say peace of mind, but by golly, if you have a lot of money, maybe you go go up in a rocket and whatnot and get happy seeing the Earth from that vantage point. But then you know, then you've got a lot of money. You can you can build a very beautiful, tranquil Zen garden and get close to nature and do a lot of earthing and so on. So there's, I don't know, I'm, I, there's a lot of things that money is able to buy, you know. I imagine you can't buy your skin color, although I don't know it's about that. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Stay black and die or, you know, pay awesome. taxes. So unfortunately, Michael Jackson isn't here to have that discussion with us. But that's that's exactly that's exactly correct. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, you start out in a zip code, and uh, you know you can buy your way out of that. Sometimes I don't know. I'd be curious to to see what people what people think. Mm -hmm. But I do. Well, that's why I'm asking this question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What money can't buy? Buy so many things. Yeah. Okay, so the reason that those two questions uh, are, are important, uh, particularly for this discussion, uh, what money can and cannot buy, is because when we think of money, we think of having it or not having it. So our question goes in a way to if we suddenly and surprisingly had no money, kind of what would we do, you know? But in order to, to think about that, I think it's important to think, well, what are the things that we need money for? And then what are the things we don't need money for? And if we don't have money, how do we get the things that we didn't need the money for anyway? And uh, can we be happy with that? You know, at least in the short term, you know? So uh, now it, I think the question comes to, what is it, what is it that you would do if suddenly, you had no money. And I can tell you that situation uh, has occurred to many people. In fact, I, 
I was in a country once where the, the government got on the radio one day and said, you know that money you had yesterday, that's not worth anything now. Uh, this is the kind of money you can use, at least, you know, here. In other countries, they said, well, in three weeks or one month or something, you have to turn in all the money you have and we'll give you the new money because after that, nope, that money's not going to be any good. So people who have been like secretly stashing all their money in mattresses and away from the government and taxes were suddenly panicking because they, in order to keep the money, they had to declare the money, you know? So if you suddenly didn't have any money, what would you do? How would you cope? What would be some of the things that you would do? Beside panic. <laughs> well, that depends on if I'm the only one that doesn't have money, but everybody around me does, then I could ask them for money. Um, but if we're all in the same boat, then we start with no money. Mm. We start bartering. Okay. All right. So we can, we can go either way. We can okay. go either way because it's a, it's, it's a hypothetical question. So you, you pick the one that you feel most interested, uh, most, uh, um, let's say you can talk about easiest. Okay. Pick that scenario, set the scenario up for us and tell us what you might do. How would it change? Either way, you don't have any money. In one case, everybody else has money, but you don't. But in one case, the money just doesn't exist. There is, well, you can have this paper, but it means nothing because nobody's taking that money. What would you pick the, the scenario and set it up for us and tell us? Well, it seems to me the easier one would be if none of us had money, then we'd all be doing the same normal things and bartering. Um, there wouldn't be as much discrimination, I think. Hold on. You call that normal? <laughs> that we would be all well, bartering? Uh, <laughs> it would be normal if we all are in the same boat. It would be normalized. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, well, in some countries, bartering might be the money. I don't know. Um, now, I think it would be easier if we all were ex experiencing the same life experience with no money, and then we have to develop some way of um, exchange, as you point out, in order to get our basic needs. Mm -hmm. So how, how would you propose that in the short term, there's no, you know, you, it's not like a case where the next day you, you have this new money, because in that case, nothing really changed, right? In other words, they say, oh, we just issuing new money, when you go to the bank, it's going to look different. It's still, but it's still money. So, or some kind of, maybe it's shells, or who knows? But the thing is, so it's just a different me medium of exchange. But in the case that nobody has the medium of exchange, what do, what would you do? In the short term, anyway, while, while they're fixing that in the back, somebody out there, who knows, is fixing that. What would you do? I would use all the resources that I have, and I don't mean I'm talking about what you can do, your workability to earn the money. I would use my resources of who I knew that might have a connection to find a job. Um, it, it isn't easy, I know been there, done it. Um, it's other human beings that help, but you have to help yourself with determination. Um, but definitely help of others, but using your own creativity in the best way that you can. Mm -hmm. Well, don't go away right, right away, Lee, because I have a follow-up question for you. Talk a little bit about that creativity. How would you use your creativity to, to 
let's say move along, maybe not as fast or a pace, but to move along to carry on with your life? Well, I don't want to go into my history, but I got along with one meal a day um, at one time and running to make that meal between a job and the meal that was, I could not always guarantee I'd get there on time, um, but I worked it out that I could do it. Mm. Um, I approached people that were in a position to uh, look where I could find more jobs. Um, the creativity of what you don't have and what you do instead, like two feet to walk the whole distance rather than transportation. That's creativity. Okay, good. I, I would, I would uh, say supplement that or with assessing what you have, what you need, and what you want. In addition to when you say, when I say what you need, what do you need in the short term? And what do you need to get more of what you need and want, you know, to restructure that? And I would say that, that in order to do that, one would think it requires some forethought. In other words, before you get to that point, some mental practice in assessing what are the critical things in your life, you know, who are the critical people? in your life? What are the critical values in your life? All of those things would go to, to help you to be create, creative so that the creativity is not just, you know, like an acid trip where you take it and then the next day, you know, you're <laughs> whatever brain you have left is functioning, you know, but, but, but the thing that you thought goes away because it only existed in your imagination. How do you do, how do we, how do we create something of this, a new life without at least the money that we had? Okay. Um, anyone else ideas about what you would do if suddenly you had no money, whether it's everybody is suddenly money is no good or you personally woke up and found that by whatever it means, where you thought you were secure, suddenly now nothing. And people do that every day, by the way, they, especially when they have a lot of money invested in stock and they wake up to find that somebody invented some widget that now that stock that they had is worth nothing. And they had leaned on that and maybe they even have like a mortgage that's tied up with the value of the stock and all of these things is usually somebody else puts all that together for them. But the bottom line is they are broke. In fact, they owe money. And that's a sudden, sudden like, whoa, never been there before, you know? So should some equivalent of that happen, whether you have money in stock or not, if something equivalent to, to that happens, what do you do? This is where we get creative. Yeah. Well, that kind of talk could be terrifying, you know, to bring that to top of mind to say, in fact, I could wake up tomorrow and everything that I have that's an asset that I think is a solid asset has somehow through nothing that I've done. All I did is went to sleep and wake up the next morning only to find that that asset is now a liability. Lots of scenarios can happen to make that happen. But I think there's a way out. And the, re the, way, the reason to, to, to bring this subject up 
especially in this way, is to get you thinking about that way out and get you to prepare for that potential. Not necessarily because it will happen, could, but more important, there's a certain amount of confidence that you have and a certain that that you can survive with either no money or much less money because you, you have figured some of these things out. And or if something really does happen, you, you've thought about it. And even if those things didn't prepare you for any, you know, that situation, at least you've thought about it more than you would have if we had not had this conversation. So one of the things that's important is to assess what's important to you, especially those things that's important to you, but money can't buy it, okay? But those are the things that even if you had money, if you suddenly didn't have those things, life would not be all that good, you know? Maybe you had a, you had a house, maybe even a better house, you had plenty of food, you have all those other things that money can buy, but there are some things that with, even with all of that, there's this big hole in your life if you, if you didn't have that. Some of those things are irreplaceable, but think about what they are so you can determine, okay, well, that thing will, I might lose that at some point. That's the way kind of how life goes. Nothing is permanent, you know, even me. But there are other things. What are the other things that I have that even if they are also, and they are uh, temporary, uh, but I have them so far, they're still there so I can enjoy them now. What are the things, what are the thing, how would you assess, let's say five things? In some systems there are, the, there are they call the seven things that are important for life, you know, to go for it other than air, water, and sometimes food, but food is often in, food and water is often include included in, in in that. So find the seven things or five things or however many you like, and tell me or tell us um, what are the things that are are really valuable to you. That if you didn't have any money, yeah, it would be a big deal. But uh, you have those things, so you have a chance to, you know, to reconstruct your life. What are, what are the things that are important to you? Let's say whether or not they cost money, that would make it easier. I think. <laughs> Jessica says a safe living environment okay okay jessica thank you um uh while you are thinking about that and while others are maybe thinking about that uh i'd like to know what you call a safe living environment sure i've been typing because i still have allergies i sound terrible but <laughs> um you know, some sort of shelter from elements. Um, shelter? Oh, sorry. Uh, shelter from the elements. Yeah. Could be a tent, but if it was, you know, in a park where I wasn't worried about who else might be in my tent, <laughs> I could live in that. The quality of cardboard that your house is made of. No. <laughs> okay. What are, okay, so shelter, that's a, a shelter and a safe living environment, okay? A shelf, safe living environment. Okay, that's one. Anybody else or Jessica, you have more? So far, I'm, I'm seeing everybody here walking around naked, you know? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> because nobody said clothes. <laughs> uh, my good health and independence. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, good health and independence. What do you mean by independence? Yeah, I was just thinking when I said that without money, I guess I'm not very independent in my, I'm depending on other people. Mm. Hmm. I'll go with just good health. Okay, okay, good health. Okay, good health. Okay, yeah. Because even with money, we're not actually independent. I think independence is one of those kind of things that they're feel good words, you know, <laughs> when you when you really boil it down to like, what do you, what do you do without the cooperation of anyone else, really, <laughs> you know? And uh, for those of of us who live in in what we loosely re refer to as civilization. The will to live. Will to live. Wow. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Especially when you wake up and you, you know, you have assumed in the past that, you know, your, your needs would be met if you had the money. In other words, we wake up and we go to the grocery store and we assume that if we have money, there will be food. That's not a given, you know? That's just something we talk about, but it's not really a given that if we have food, if we have money, there will be food. In fact, there are many countries where there are people who have money, but they can't buy very much food. Even, even if they can buy food, it's not the food that they want. You know, in other words, you can buy as much food as you want as long as it's gruel, you know, as <laughs> long as it's, it's oatmeal, we can give you that. But other than that, there is no other food. You know, there are situations like that, okay? Uh, I've been in situations in South Dakota where I go into the grocery store to buy food, but there's almost nothing I want. That's why I sometimes drive all the way down to Sioux Falls to find, you know, that's, that's eccentric. I know, <laughs> but it's a thing. Okay, so uh, how about how about uh, any other things that uh, you would think about if suddenly you didn't have any money? What are what are the things? What would you do? We have we have two new victims. In our <laughs> in our discussion, so what are the other things you would do if suddenly and surprisingly your money was gone, your assets became liabilities? Anybody? Betty, you have to turn your mic on. <laughs> we want to hear what you're, you're whispering. <laughs> I guess we should have remained in the dark here. We just popped in because we didn't leave home as early as we thought we would this morning. Okay. So good, good, my good. son John Welcome. with me today, and we're going to be traveling. So oh. carry on. We're enjoying it. Welcome. Welcome. We're all buzzard, so we can carry on. I think it's a difficult question to ponder hmm. being I'm not experienced, like living in a third world country where there's not food, where there's not um, basic needs, where there's not clean water. So I can't comprehend some of these things. So it's hard to put myself in that place of needing all those things because I always expect them to be there. Hmm. Clean water, food, shelter, heat, hmm. yeah. Clothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was, uh, thank you for that, Carolyn. I, I feel very fortunate that one, actually two of my childhood mentors were, one was Jewish and one was uh, Chinese. And they had both come from places where the places that they lived, the government or situation changed where and they were both rather well to do before. And then suddenly they had no assets and they could only leave with the clothes on their back and a life within themselves. 
and they had to travel to different places and begin life all over again. And I was fortunate enough that two of them, most people never have any, but I had two of them who talked to me about this problem of money suddenly having no value. And in the process, they, they taught me about how the dependence on the idea that money is the thing that you want is very dangerous to me as a person because money isn't the thing that I want. Money is the things that money, I think money can buy is what I want, not the money. The money is just paper. It's just an idea in some cases. You don't ever touch the paper. It's just plastic card or a phone call that transfers the money. You never touch it in many cases, right? Many people today have their paychecks even directly deposit. They never, and, and very few people go to a place and people pay them in, in what we call money. They might get a check that they can exchange for money and then exchange the money for a thing. But finally, they didn't want the check and they did not want the money. They wanted what the money could buy. And so what they explained to me was even the things that people buy with the money, many times they don't want that. They want what those things represent. For example, people will buy a car thinking how they look in the car rather than how far the car can take them someplace, you know? They're just as happy with the car being broke down, apparently, on the side of the road, as long as they look good, you know? Or as the, or as the guys used to say when I was in junior high school, you know, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you look when you play the game, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that's the kind of thing I learned that, oh, wait a minute. And they pointed out to me, if you can, if you can find out what it is that you really want and work to get that, then even if you pay money, you'll pay a lot less for it because you know what the value is of the thing. For example, many people buy clothes or other things so that they get the respect of their peers, family, and neighbor. Because people have often say, oh, who's John? Oh, he's the guy with the new, he's the guy that drives that new Cadillac. Or he's the guy with, the, with that big red pickup, you know? That becomes his identity, you know? Uh, he's the guy who makes a lot of money. He made a lot of money. And why do people make the money? Well, according to those who make it, they say that what they really want is quote, respect and admiration. They want their other peers to look up to them, to defer to them, to make them feel important. And the more they rise up that ladder of things that they have, that translates to some kind of power because the more people say, oh, he's got this, he has this, he has, he's a billionaire, you know, the more they defer to that person's judgment on how to make a ballpoint pen when the person has never touched a ballpoint pen. But there's this sort of halo effect that money has. And that halo effect is if I have money, I must be doing things right. Money is or becomes the, the uh, lingua franca of the halos. You know, it's like, if I got that, I'm good. You know, so we reduce our efforts to making money when what we want is to feel like other people love and respect us. And that means that if we are in trouble, they will come to our defense. 
And that gives people a sense of security. And if we have that sense of security, according to Maslow, that's one of the important things, you know, in the, our hierarchy of needs. You know, it's very high on our hierarchy of needs. We need to feel security. And that security often comes from the feeling that if I'm in trouble, if I'm in need, people will come to me. They will come to my need. They will come to my defense. They will help me. I'm not saying that's always true. I'm saying that's the illusion in, you know, that, that causes many people to, to want and strive to get more money. Okay, so that's kind of what I, I, I want people to, to reflect on. Um, the other questions kind of lead up to that, but, and I think that it's important to go through those questions like, well, what is money? You know, the definition of money. What do you use money for? What is it that money can't buy? That even if you have a lot of money, you can't get it. Um, and then uh, pondering that question, what do you do if suddenly you don't have money? And I think that will help us to live with the money that we have better. Uh, I think Carolyn had something to say. No, I just left my mic open listening to you and oh. came to the conclusion um, money cannot buy respect is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. This is a, it's a good topic for our minds to explore, but it is a difficult one. So thank you for that. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have anything that they would add because our time is pretty close to an end now? Okay, well, we will uh, pick up uh, next week, same time, same station. Um, if you if you have some uh, thoughts on anything, any of these things that we cover, like after you, you know, we some of these things that like they're a whole new thinking, they bring up new questions, and you hear other people discuss something, and it brings up an idea that you didn't have before that causes you to think of a, a, of even a different thing. That's the best case scenario for these things. Um, Let's see if maybe we can, you know, write those things down and maybe we'll just have a session one day when we, you know, and let us know when you have some and we, we can come back on one of these sessions and revisit those things that, you know, and try to remember what we were talking about. And you think, you know, after I thought about that, after Lee said this, I thought, oh yeah, after I thought about it for a while, I remember two days later that I had a, a certain situation that came up in my life that that comment uh, became more relevant when I re remembered that incident, you know, and the incident kind of clarified itself or something that you, that you, that you have uh, experienced. And then we can share those things with other people, okay? Okay. So <laughs> with that said, I guess we'll see you guys again next week. Same time, same station. <laughs> That's what I came for, Lawrence. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> see you then. Okay, bye. <laughs>